I would also like to just thank all of you for coming out today. Uh, we, we, we cherish these times that we can come together and have fellowship. And, and actually, when our uh, family members and friends come, because it definitely gives us the time <laughs> just to fellowship with you as well as just uh, talk, uh, uh, be spiritual and, and, and share the word of God that you know increases faith in our life so that our lives can be pleasing to God. Um, today, we're going to do a continuation of what we were talking about last week. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Colossians. We're just going to read one verse out of it, and then we'll make some different applications as we go. Colossians, the fourth chapter. We're going to read just one verse. That'll be the sixth verse. Colossians 4 and 6. Colossians 4 and 6. Colossians 4 and 6. Have it, say amen. 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 Let's read. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Amen. Today we're going to um, have a study today. This is very non traditional. Um, I know what well, some of you are familiar with as it pertains to uh, coming together for a Bible study, but we really believe that the Word of God is meant to transform our lives. And the only way we can really do that is to apply the word of God to our lives. So we study to show ourselves approved unto God as workmen who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And then we get this information that God gives us. And it's just not enough to have the information. What do we need to do with the information? Apply. Amen. We need to apply the information. And this is what we've been looking at these last week or so. We've been talking about how we come together and how so many individuals study God's word and they may be properly interpret it or may not properly interpret it. And it seems as though the most of the reason that people study God's word is for the sake of debate. It's for the sake of having the say that I know more than you do or if you say something wrong, I'll correct you on how to say it. But the actual application to one's life is vitally important if, and if, if, in fact, you want to allow Christ to live through you. And that's what all of our desire is to do. Let's look at a passage of scripture in Romans, the 12th chapter. Now, I read this passage quite a bit because it's so essential to who we are as members of the body of Christ. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2 of Romans, the 12th chapter, because when we're talking about how we should behave or conduct ourselves, this particular passage lines directly up with that premise. It says, I beseech you, this is Romans 12 chapters, verse 1 and 2. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sac sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So now it's talking about the presentation of your body. And when you talk about presenting your body, you're talking about presenting your body as a living sacrifice. Now, now, we want to make this applicable right off the bat. This means if I'm going to make my body a living sacrifice unto God, and, this, and that term had never been used before, and it was, it's an oxymoron. Have it, any of you ever seen a sacrifice that was allowed to live? No. Well, most sacrifices are what? Dead. Dead, dead sacrifice. So the Bible says that we're living sacrifices. And this is why we're living sacrifice, because what we are supposed to do based upon the, uh, what, what God's word, we're supposed to allow Christ to come in us. We're supposed to dismiss our agenda, our uh, desires, and our things that we desire to do, and allow Christ to be the first and foremost in our lives. That's a process there. Yes. You know, a lot of individuals look at it as something that you just snap your fingers and do, but the only way you can allow Christ to live through you is to get God's information inside of your mind. And look what verse 2 says, and this definitely goes right with it. And this is a, a part of what we're going to actually deal with today. It says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed how? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, last week I began, and I actually wrote this. On the board. But today we want to just talk about it just a little more. We're talking about conformity to transformity. Based on the verse that you see in front of you. 
An individual is born into this world and he's raised by his parents, his guardians, or whatever environment that he's raised in. What is the conformity that the, this, this passage is saying he's being raised in? The world. This world. This world. Amen. So this is something that you want to No one escapes this. You're raised in the conformity of this world. This world has its different views, its different ways of, of operation. And it's all based on the premise of an individual who is the prince of the power of the ear. And he's, the Bible says that he's the little g god of what? This world. Of this world. He has an agenda. He says things a certain way. He wants your mindset to be adjusted to be a certain way. He's in charge of all the propaganda, all the advertisement that's on TV. It's not, a, it's not a coincidence that when you watch television and individuals begin to magnify Jesus Christ or they say something good on the behalf of Jesus Christ that's proper and rightly divided that they don't get any airplay. You ever notice that? Yes, sir. Most of the time when somebody says something that magnifies Jesus Christ, they try to, even when an uh, uh, athlete or somebody does a good play or he makes something good, and, and, and the first thing they do is throw the mic up in his face, and he says, first of all, I want to uh, give honor and God, uh, uh, praise God, my, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that different type of thing. What, what does the announcer do? He either pull the mic or he just, oh, well, you know, just try to brush him right past that. You ever notice that? Yeah. Because the conformity of this world is not designed to magnify God in its proper way. It's not, it's, that's not what Satan or the God of this world wants to do. He has us shaped in conformity of this world. And that's what our mindset is. I don't know how old you were when you accepted the fact that Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures, that he was, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day. I don't know how you, old you were before, before that happened, happened in your life. But up until that point, this is all you could do. Take on the conformity of your world. So think about it. For some of you, huh, some of you may be uh, 37, some of you may be 27. Think about how much conformity of the world you have on yourself. You ever realize that? That's right. So now if you're looking at some type of scale, depending on like, how I can, I can do myself. Before I really was saved, I was 33. So you got 33 years. And, oh yeah, this is something I can throw in here. I didn't even mean to do this. Today I'm 49. Oh, happy birthday. No, not today, I'm oh. Today, I'm oh. <laughs> <laughs> And that's something I'm getting to. December 10th, I'll be 50. So you might have 33 times 50. You got 17 years of potential. What? Uh, what did you say? Transformation. Transformation. Thy potential to transform is 17 years. Okay. You see that? Before that, I, had, I could do what I thought was good stuff. I could help little old ladies across the street. I could say nice things to people. But all of that was deceitful lust. You know where I'm going with that? I thought it was good, though. It is good. It is good? Yeah. Well, according to the scriptures, it's deceitful lust. You see what I'm saying? Sometimes people, we look at things as being good, but until you actually begin to transform yourself into the image of who? Christ. God is not accepting anything that's based on this. Now, this is another issue with this. Lots of times we begin to make our journey from our conformity With the potential. Why am I saying potential? Because it's not what happened. You, you say, you believe, now this is it. You believe that Christ died for your sins according to scripture. You believe that he died, he was buried on, he rose on the third day. The potential is there. Now what do you have to do to take full advantage of that potential that God has given you? What is that one thing he's given you that now you can begin to make progress in, in Christ? His spirit. Amen. His spirit. And his spirit bears witness with our spirit. And his spirit also gives us the ability to do what? Study his word. Study, study his, his word. word. It's one person in here talking to me today. <laughs> is study his word. What's so important about studying his word and getting, and getting the right understanding out of it? That's where the renewed mind comes from. Amen. Come on now. This is it. You have to understand this is what God wants. 
God only wants to deal with us from the basis of our renewed mind. We're going to get into this later. This old mindset, or the Bible calls it the old conversation. In fact, let's go back to, we're going to have to do a little bit of review. Turn back to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. I'm going to try to hit home a little bit today. Ephesians 4, we look at verses uh, 22, and we'll go down from there. Ephesians 4, 22. Look what it says here. That you put off the former conversation of who? Old man. Old man. Look who he is. This is that old man here. How many think that he needs to be put off? Why does he need to be put off? Because in him is all no good thing. There's no good thing in him. This guy here has absolutely nothing to do with Christ. He didn't want any parts of Christ. Right. He's an enmity against God. Amen. Everything he is is contrary. Even that he, even the things that look good and wholesome out of him, they're really deceitful. Look what he goes on to say. That you put off the, of the former conversation, the old man, which is what? Corrupt. Corrupt according to what? The deceitful lust. The deceitful lust. You know what deceit is? Sin. It, see, it definitely manifests itself as sin. But has anybody ever been deceitful toward you? Mm -hmm. Hope you understand what deceit is. You see, the deceit is a, it, it's a mask. It's a, a masquerade to try to play one way as another, another, and doing another thing totally. False representation. False representation. It's deceit. It looks good on the outside, but the inside is a bad motive. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to build your trust. I'm trying to gain so I can Bernie murder off you. Mm. <laughs> I'm trying to get you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. On the outside, I'm the great. This is why the saint transforms his ministers into what? <clears throat> Ministers of righteousness. And listen, the worst thing that Satan is doing today doesn't look bad. It's not Halloween. That's right. People try to, it's not Halloween and this witchcraftery stuff that are, no, it's people in the pulpit trying to tell you that you have to work for your salvation. That's right. That's right. You have to do something. It's about you. You got to get better. You got to do better. You have to do this. You need to do that. And they say, they saying all the things you need to do. And they're negating the fact that Jesus Christ did everything for you over 2,000 years ago on Calvary's cross, and all you need to do is trust it. That's right. They don't even want that to be the issue. That's right. So now they form religion. They, they form this type of thing that, uh, that uh, read to do over again, legios to bind or attach myself to fellowship with God, and you have religion that you're seeing over and over. People are trying to make an attempt to establish and keep a relationship with God. Right. So they tell you, they, they use Bible terms to say, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from what? All unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. But now when you sin again, guess what you're going to have to do all over again? Confess. You're going to have to confess your sins and he'll be faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But when you sin again, guess what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to confess your sins, and then he'll be faithful and just to forgive you. But guess what? If you keep doing it, that means that you're willfully sinning. Yeah. Yeah. Now, see, somebody know what I'm talking about that. You see that? So now if you're willfully sinning, the Bible says if this man willfully sins, what's about the person that's out there willfully sinning? Here's a, here's a problem with this guy. This guy that's out here willfully sinning, there's no hope for this guy. He is, he, he's a reprobate. His mind has been, his heart has been hardened. So now you have individuals believing because they're going through a struggle or this time in their life that they must be reprobate. Or, or God must have hardened their heart. So now they've given up because instead of placing their, finish, uh, placing their trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ, they're placing their trust in man. Turn to Philippians 4. Philippians 4. Love this passage here. We're gonna be a little brief today, but we're gonna definitely look. actually Philippians three. I'm sorry about that. Philippians three. This is what we're striving for. This is what we're striving for here. This is what the apostle Paul says. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made what conformable. 
Not conformable to this world, but conformable to what? His death. His death. That's over here in the transformation. This is what we have to understand. Why is it so important that you understand you have to be conformable to his death? What was it? Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20 because he died for us. Listen, you don't want to take death on by yourself. You understand what I'm saying here? You don't want to take death on it. You want to take advantage of the death that Jesus Christ provided for you on Calvary's cross. Because he comes out of death victorious. If you try to experience death on your own, guess what? You're going to lose. And you're going to, and your destiny is going to be eternal de um, damnation. So we want to take on the conformity of his death. Look what it says. If by any means I might attain what? Unto the resurrection of the dead. This is my hope. So if I take on his death, I'm not worried about whether or not I'm going to re be resurrected. My resurrection is already one in him. If It says, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, uh, after if that I may apprehend that for which I so I am apprehended. Of Christ Jesus. He says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are where? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Reaching forth unto those things where? Right. <laughs> this is a premise that you need to establish in your life. You have to understand that your Christian walk is a process. <coughs> and we never in this flesh reach the mark and touch it. We're always approaching or attaining to hit the mark. That's what our this term is important. People have miscued or misunderstood this term for quite some time. When you're talking about sanctification or being sanctified, sanctification is the fact that God the Father took us and placed us in his son, Jesus Christ. It means that we've been made holy by the fact that God took us and placed us somewhere that was holy. And that was in Christ. That is our position. Our positional sanctification is the fact that when God looks at you now, guess who he sees? You have to get this. See, this is the 100% victory program. If you have trusted the fact that Christ died for your sins according to scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day, God has positionally placed you in Christ. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live it by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. When God the Father sees you, he sees his son Christ. We get this? We, he sees his righteousness. <coughs> this is something we should be joyous about here. That is the fact of the matter. That doesn't change. But this is a portion that we have to work on. The practical part of that, or our practice in our sanctification. And what we were dealing with last week is the fact that once we be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind, what should be an, uh, 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 an example of that, or what should be evidence of that, is what comes <coughs> out of our what? Wow. Hope you get this. You, you, you understand? If I'm filling my mind up with spiritual information, spiritual wisdom, spiritual understanding, when you ask me a question or me and you engage in a conversation, that should be the first thing that comes out of my mouth because it's going to give you a representation of whether I'm here or whether I'm partaking in this. We get this? Because we're going to go into something. You're going to have to be interactive today. I'm going to ask you a few questions. Because I was really concerned that some of the remarks and comments I heard after, and this is important, whenever you have a world event or whenever something hits the news and it's the major topic on the news, you as a member of the body of Christ 
have to, within your <coughs> spiritual mind and your spiritual understanding, begin to try to understand what would Christ say or how would Christ conduct himself today within the age of grace based on the doctrine of Christ that is in me. You understand what I'm saying? Now look, this is important because when we look back at our opening text in Colossians, look what it says here. <clears throat> Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech be always what? Grace. With grace. How often should your speech be with grace? All, that means all the time. Is it all the time? You have to recognize that. See, we're not, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. You need to recognize how much of your mind, and it really comes down to <coughs> how much of your mind are you developing so that when the situation presents itself, you can speak from the transformed, renewed mind rather than the old conformity of the mind. See, this is you here. This is what you're comfortable <coughs> with. This comes out so easy. This should begin to take over that. But if you don't put in the work, you don't begin to study to show yourself approved under God as a workman who need not be ashamed, rightly divide the word of truth. If you don't study your Bible, you just go to church and you churchy, but you don't really get into the word and really care much about the word, I guarantee you this is all you're doing. You're saying some churchy stuff, but it really is not transform mind stuff. Watch this. I'm going to give you just a little quick sample of what we're talking about here. This is one of the most popular, and I'm talking a little, you know, from the dynamic of my environment a little bit here. But this is something that I throw out there because there always should be open-end questions that you try to open a conversation with with somebody. Oftentimes when I, even you might see and hear me ask you this. I say, how are you doing today? How's everything going? How are you doing today? Have I ever asked some of you that? By sure, that's, my, that's my thing. I want to break the ice. How are you doing today? Yeah. You know, some people think, oh, that's just cultural or whatever. No. How are you doing? I really, this is where I'm at. I need to see you, especially if you're spiritual. I'm, I'm gauging you. I'm not judging you, but I'm seeing where you're spiritual at. How are you doing today? How are you doing? Sometimes, and, and I'm talking about within all my spiritual circles, uh, especially with, when I'm at work, sometimes, and most of the time, this is the most common response, and you can see probably what kind, who is the most people that I deal with and uh, what they're saying based upon their conduct. I'd say, how are you doing today? I'm doing. <laughs> I've heard that. I'm doing. But how are you? I'm doing. What is that? You see, it's trendy. That's trend now. Was they saying that in the 70s? That wasn't the term 80s? Not even 90s. But now I'm doing. So now they caught on into a semantic that is developed over here because it ain't have nothing to do with God. Is God getting any glory out of? No. no. And they ain't even putting a G on it. <laughs> you ever recognize that? I'm doing. Not ain't, I'm not doing. I'm doing. So And it's really it. And they stop it right there. So in fact, they say, I'm just here. I'm here. Yeah. Wow. Leave me alone. Basically, that's, we don't have to go too much further in this conversation. See how subtle this is? Now, these are lies. Now, if somebody asks you during your life a question like that or something similar to that, it's what we and Scott talk about. They're throwing you a lob ball. Because now you can open your day with an interaction that can do what? It can give glory to God. Have you developed that in your mindset that you want to start from the top of your morning to give, start giving glory to God so that somebody really can see that the transformation has begun in your life? Are you filled with the spirit that much? See, I've been misled to believe that being filled with the spirit was being prayed up and listening to music and just, just, uh, and just worshiping and getting in this zone and just doing all that. But being filled with the spirit is being filled with the knowledge of his word. And having a thankful and appreciative and gracious spirit toward God at all times because you realize who he is in your life. So if I'm filled with that and you ask me, how am I doing? What's well, some of the responses I should get? All right. See, now that's beautiful. 
You say she highly favored, richly blessed. Now, see, that's something that you hear a lot, but you, I know she's going, she's, she's coming from a spiritual vantage point. She, she's saying she favored and she's blessed. Well, now I might want to get, what you mean you favored and blessed? What's all this favored and blessed? You see what I'm saying? Because I got an attitude action. So now she come with that. That gives an opportunity so I can start spilling out this transformed mind. Amen. I'm just waiting for an opportunity. Yes. Yeah. Yes. What are you putting in your mind so that that is your conversation that is coming out of your mouth? This is important. So now there's other questions and other dynamics that we've been hearing about these last few weeks, and this is some of the things you have heard. Now, often and right now, what is very popular in society is the fact, what you think about that Ferguson thing? What you think, what you think about that, oh man, that, that Ferguson or that Staten Island situation? What you think about that Staten Island situation? See, it, it, see the rubber hit the road here, you see? And now, because if we're not here, we're somewhat uncomfortable because if we ain't have the right information on what we're going to give, we're going to be real. Some of us are not uncomfortable, unfortunately. In fact, I'm going to see, for the benefit of some of you that weren't here last week, these are just some of the things that were posted. From people who I know believe the fact that Christ died for their sins according to Scripture, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day. Right? Yeah. Now that was really pretty much what the topic was. The guy was like, well, what do you think about this Ferguson thing? One guy, he says, well, does anybody remember any, uh, any riots or violence when O.J. Simpson was found innocent of crime and he obviously committed? I don't. <laughs> This was his. This was his comeback. Now, get, get, this guy was a guy who was saved, who should have been here, but that's what he wanted his response to be. He felt as though that would be a a good wholesome response for a member of the body of Christ to go forth with. Okay. So now, once he says that, it spawns more responses. And that's what you want to do. You want to say something so that individuals can engage in conversation. But you want to say things so they can engage in conversation for the purpose of what? Come on now, there's a moment what? Give the glory to God. See, if you believe the fact that Christ died for your sins according to scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day, now your office is the fact that you are an ambassador for who? That's who you're supposed to be. A lot of us don't understand it. A lot of us don't take it serious. A lot of times we join churches. The church say you join the membership, take the new memberships class. Okay, now we want you to get in the choir. We want you to go over here. We want you to do this and do that. But they never tell you that you're supposed to be an ambassador for Christ. And in order to be an effective ambassador for Christ, you have to put on the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ says that you have to study the word of God, rightly divide so the things that come out of your mouth will reflect Christ rather than who? Man or yourself. See, you're trying to put on Christ so that you don't say the things that some more comments. Just want to re kind of like re get there because I got some good news also. But we just want to see. This is the conversation the some of the things you heard. Exactly. Talking about O.J. verdict. You could tell that they were ready for whatever. The verdict was going to bring, well, whatever the verdict was going to bring down. By the way, they were dressed. They were already in black and had their faces covered with the black hoodies. On either way, they were going to wreak havoc on that town. People are making fun of this here, she said, but uh, just imagine if you lived in that town and you had nothing to do with it this with this and you were just trying to live an honest life and pray for the cops who have to deal with these fools. They do it every year in Virginia Beach. They come in and buy droves, loot, vandalize, hurt each other. Last year they had fatalities and hundreds of cars. They threw couches out of the motels on Atlantic Avenue. 
the garbage they left on the streets was unbelievable. Now, you know what this little conversation was spawned by? An individual asking what did he think about Ferguson, a person responding that was highly a member of the body of Christ, and everybody jumped on to what he had to say. Did any of that conversation I just say give glory to God? No. This is why you have to be careful with what comes out of your mouth. Yes. You see how, you see how we just, we went in, and let's go to Hebrews, because Hebrews 3, just, I mean, James 3, I'm sorry about that. James 3 really <coughs> talks about this tongue issue, and it's an interdispensational truth how James was making a reference to what, uh, how the Spirit was giving James this information as it pertains to this tongue. And we just wanted to kind of reiterate this because it's so important that we begin to get our tongue together. Now, we get our tongue together by transforming our mind because from abundance of the heart, what? The mouth, the mouth speaks. So we want to change our heart, which has our mind, so that our mouth speaks right. Look at uh, James 3. If you just wanted to jump on some of the dynamics of this, I'm going to jump down to two because verse one is definitely something that's dealing with more um, dispensational. But look at verse two of James three. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and is able to do what? Bridle. Well, you know what it means to bridle the body? Paul says it like this. He says he holds his body under subjection. under subjection. So in other words, you can keep your body under subjection by what comes out of your mouth. Your mouth is more important than your actions, your words and your deeds, but the thing that comes out first is your words. Because whatever is in your heart is going to come out of your mouth. So God is saying, fill your mind up with some good stuff so when you open your mouth, the right thing comes out. You get that? So then now, in James it says, behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold, also the ships, which, which though they be so great, and are driven by forced winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listed. Even so, the tongue is a little member, and boasts great things. Behold, how great a little, man, a, a little a fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth fire the course of nature, and is set on hell fire. You, you see how it's set on, uh, it says, setteth on fire the course of nature. You see how you can make one statement, and then people attach themselves to the statement, and then it can get out of hand? Not only was the person who initiated the conversation a believer, but the people that got into the conversation was a believer, and the reason their conversation went there because they're still dealing with this area of their life. Now listen, I'm not the one to say that sometimes you might not say something from here because everything that comes out of your mouth, believe me, is not spiritual. You're still in these bodies. Amen. But we need to be mindful that when we're representing Christ everywhere we are, in our families, on our jobs, in our neighbors, wherever we are, that this is what we want to put forth. The transformed mind. The information that we receive based upon studying God's word. The right thing to say. Something that is wholesome. Something that administers grace to the hearer. This is what we, we strive and go on to attempt to say. Turn to Ephesians 4.22. Just looked at that there. that you may put off concerning your former conversation. Now, you see why it says conversation? Now, some people have, 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 have marked that as lifestyle. But you realize that it's really your conversation from the vantage point of how important the words that come out of your mouth are. We, when we become uh, 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 members of the body of Christ, it's not enough just to... Um, receive the salvation and then just live out your life without the transformity that God wants to take place because you'll be no representation of that. Verse 23, and be renewed where? In the, In the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man which is 
after God, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Jump down to verse 29 there. Now look what it says here. Let no corrupt communication do what? Proceed out of your mouth. We see what that says. Now, see, this is when people talk about grace, they say it seems like it's just no accountability in grace. Y'all seem like y'all just telling people they can, you know, if they believe the fact that Christ died for their sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day, you know, they saved and there's no, no accountability. There's nothing else they need to do. But this is what God wants you to do. You see what he's saying there? When you study to show yourself re uh, approved and you renew your mind, you set yourself up so that there'll be no corrupt communication that is to proceed out of your mouth. And this is just not a small issue. This is not a minor issue. This is something that you want to begin to develop within yourself and be very mindful of it wherever you are. If you're not studying God's word effectively, you do not have the capability to say the things that God wants you to say. I'm going to have to test you again. Some of you look like you're attending, but I'm not sure exactly really see what we're saying. This is one question I want to ask. Time is getting away. How, how far are we trying? How long are we going? Okay. So this is the question. Because this is what we're looking at. Listen, this, this is who you are. You're an ambassador for Christ. You come here, and now this is what you do. When we come here on Sundays, now you should, you should supplement this, this type of activity with some type of Bible study of your own or a family Bible study or in a church Bible study or something else so that you can be constantly getting the information in your system. And the more you do it, the more you'll be filled with it. The less you do it, the less you'll be filled with the spirit of, uh, and really what it's talking about is spiritual understanding. And the more you'll still be basing your conduct in your life on this. You get that? You're trying to erase the old man and put on the new man, as Ephesians tells us. And the new man is based upon renewed understanding. He's a part of this transformation that you are making. So now you're looking at life and you're gauging life based upon the things that, the, you know, the, the instances that come at you. And this is what you have, your two things that you're doing. You want to do everything that you do in word and in deed, you're doing it um, on whose behalf? Lord. On the, the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So now everything that comes out of your mouth and everything that you do should be based upon the doctrine that you have in you. So now, I'm going to ask a question. Now, this is just one of those questions. This is a live question again. Guy over here is conversation, and you, I don't know if he got fed up with Christianity or it hadn't been presented to him properly or whatever it might be. But I guess he heard somebody preach the gospel, and he said, this is what he said. It is foolish to think that all you have to do to be saved is believe that Jesus died for your sins. It's foolish to believe that. Now think about who you are. This is what he says. You're in the midst of it, and you're in a position that you can respond to him. Now see, I see some of your minds just churning. I want to know what's the most effective thing I can say here to this individual. And he's saying it with a little bite. He ain't saying it mild. He really saying that foolish. Man, it's foolish to think that all you have to do is to be saved is believe that Jesus died for your sin. What would be your response? Jeremy. That's what the Bible says. Amen. See, so Jeremy would say, that's what the Bible says. That's your requirement. Somebody, okay, one. God made it simple so that everybody could get in to Jesus Christ that wanted, you know, to get in. God and made it simple. That's no works involved. So when we get upstairs to heaven, we can't puff ourselves up and say, I got here because of what I did. All right, now you say, this guy said it's foolish, and that would have been his response. Wanda, what you what would you going to say? Uh, the first thing I would tell him is let's pull out our Bible. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, but now, okay, now, to be honest, now, y'all y'all just somewhere casual. Okay. You know, now, if you, that's still where y'all can go, that's cool, but I'm just saying, y'all just somewhere just, you know, I at the picnic. Have, I have a smartphone. Uh oh, okay. 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 Bible's on the smartphone. All right, all right. And you're telling the gospel. Now, listen to what he said, though. B 
Because all of this is good, but I want you, I want, see, when we're talking, this is what the, the actual verse that we're actually opening up with. See, I want you to understand that this is proactive and we need to have a response that's going to be effective. Let your speech be always first with what? Grace. That means that we're administering. This is the grace of God is what we're going to come out of our mouth with, right? Now, this is the season. What does the season with salt mean? It's the manner in which you're doing it. You see, you're doing it delicately in the place to preserve that particular situation so that it can, you know, it doesn't get out of hand. That you may know how you ought to answer every man. So this is this. So now she took him to the gospel. But now this is what you need to know. This is why we study. Listen what the question is. It is foolish to think that you all you have to do to be saved is believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins. Steve. We're preaching on the cross that doesn't have parents is foolish. <laughs> but not to us what I say is the power of God. Amen. Amen. Why would you bring that verse in? Because he brought in foolishness. Because he brought in foolishness. Okay. You want to respond to him with what God is going to respond to him with. The whole idea, that's what God, you know what? He says, it's foolish for you to think that all you have to do is be saved. God said you would say that. God said you would say that. He said that it's foolishness to them that perish. But unto us that are saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. Go ahead, brother. I know you want to get in. The wisdom of God is foolishness on the man, and the wisdom of man is foolishness on the God. Amen. You see, you have to bring it in. You, and see, now you might not have your Bible, so where did you need to store that information? You have to have it. How do you get to a point where you can memorize verses? You have to study it. You Listen, I'm not studying this so that I can say I know more than the person. And when I'm talking to this brother, I'm not trying to shoot him down so that he can look little and I can look big. I'm trying to win this person for Christ. He just made a statement that opened the door of utterance to me so I could come into him with the word of God rightly divided in a manner that it may produce salvation in his life. Yes. And if you're not equipped to do that, you miss the opportunity. How many times have you missed the opportunity because you weren't filled with the spirit and had the right words to say at the time that they were supposed to be said? Titus 3. Go ahead. Titus 3, verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to magistrates, to be ready to do every good work, mm -hmm. to be to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, to go to Ferguson thing, mm -hmm. but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Here we go. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, Amen. disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and evil, hateful and hating one another. Here go the bond. But after the kindness and love of God, <laughs> our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness that which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. You see? Amen. So we have something to say. When these opportunities present themselves, are you equipped? That's why we come together on Sundays, and as often as other times that you can. We're not coming here to entertain. We're not coming here for a social club. It's good for the fellowship and the sociality that we have within, the, uh, within this assembly. But the fact of the matter is that we need to transform our minds so that when we leave this building, we are equipped to deal with whatever this world is ready to throw at us. And guess what? It's ready to throw something at you. Because it's a test of your faith. You know your faith is on top. Your faith is being tested every to every day, all day. Yes. Yes. And the question is, are you passing the test? Because the only faith that God is expecting, uh, 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 expecting for you to come out of you is the faith of His Son Jesus Christ. And the faith of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Is only shown in these sound words that's found in Romans the Philemon, and rightly divided. So when an individual asks you those questions, you should be able to jump all over. 
These are little open-ended questions. Just want to see. Somebody might ask you now, if you had a dinner party or something, you know, people study what to say or do a conversation or icebreaker question. What motivates you? Amen. What motivates you, Scott? To make all men see the fellowship oh, of the mystery. Boy, wow. Wow. You know what a can of arms are? I was just trying, I was just just breaking the ice, and he done went into to make all men see the fellowship. Man, what is this fellowship or what mystery? Now he he just created a platform so all everything the next two hours that might come out of his mouth is, is Pauline doctrine, sound doctrine to that person. He could have said, you know what motivates me is to make sure that, you know, I get my career together, you know what I'm saying, and make sure that my life is going, you know, respectable. You know, I just want to be respectable. When I leave here, I just want to say, I did something. I want to leave my mark on this work. You know, some of that empty stuff. You ever heard that kind of conversation? All the time. But who's expecting him to say to make all men see the fellowship of the mystery? Where is that verse even? Is that in the Bible? He's Ephesians 3.9. He's Ephesians 3.9. See, he's ready, though. Well, that was just a question off the top. What do you plan to do after you retire? <laughs> now that's a good answer. <laughs> that's what the going to do. I don't know how spiritual it's going to be, but hey, it's just the truth in that case. What do you plan? What do you, what's your plan? Any plans? Oh, some of us already retired. What did you do when you retired? Sure, sure. What's up, sir? What's your, I thought you were doing that before you retired. You're still doing it. You see? <laughs> no, I'm <gonna> kind of <laughs> Go ahead, Jack. I want, when I retired, I wanted to find out truth. I wanted truth. And I know there was only one book on this land. Mm -hmm. I wanted truth. I did it in the world. I did what the world did. So the one book that you're talking about, the Quran? No. <laughs> you, did, you weren't specific. <laughs> No. Um, you see what I'm saying? So when you yeah. say saying stuff, yeah, I have to break it all down. Amen. So that, I'm gonna say I, I, I would just follow up because I, you know right. there's only one book. Okay, yeah. uh, I can the Raven. You know I can go into a lot of stuff, but you want to be very specific. Yeah. You know because yeah. we're trying to encourage encourage these individuals that what we're saying creates some type of uh, uh, desire for them to seek after godly things, and that's that's really what we want to take a look at. So when we're looking at these things, we see that there's a lot of opportunities that we have every day, every day to instill sound doctrine to a person in a manner that God can get the glory out of their life. And that's what we desire to do. We desire to talk to individuals from a vantage point that when we say something that they can actually hear the difference in our conversation and the world's conversation. Where are you at there? Are you making those strides? Do you, do you desire to make that transition in your life that you know you're saying some things and you know what, when that particular um, instance comes up and somebody may ask you a question, are you going to respond in a manner that may in, incite a riot? Or are you going to give glory to God by what comes out of your mouth? This is something we need to know. How are you doing today? Jeff, how you doing? I'm doing great. You're doing great? Another day for me to uh, minister the word of God to people that's voting in. Amen. Amen. Well, now, that might make some people uncomfortable. They may think she kind of like, you know, some type of, uh, what they call Jesus, Jesus fanatic or something. You know what I mean? Talking about minister the word of God. But do you care about that? You, you know what I'm saying? Do you care about, see, don't worry about those moments of awkwardness when you're doing stuff, when you're talking for the sake of Christ. Because you'll be surprised that that little moment of awkwardness might change somebody's life. Be willing to take that on. You know, you, some of us are so cool, we don't want to get that little period that you, I, you know, I have, I've been putting myself in a lot of awkward situations just for the sake of that one person might get saved. You see? So we continue to do things and say things that we really want. Now, the old man's identity. So that we'll know. 
What do you think his identity is primarily focused on? What's the first thing your identity is focused on from the time you're a child? What do you think is the me biggest? Me, myself, and I. Me, myself, and I. I'll write it. Somebody say the world. Flesh. Be more specific. You're talking about the old man in your particular situation as you see everybody else. What is this old man, his design, what is it, his outlook on the world, what is it based on? What's the first thing he has to deal with? His mind. His mind? That mind is being developed. Sin. Sin, that's the issue. Sin is a big issue, and he can't escape that. That probably should be up here. What's some of those things that 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 really identify this old man and his status? Negativity towards everything. Negativity. His, that's that's up. That's one of the attributes or characteristics of him. Yeah. His you view. Know? His view of God. What if, what is his view of God? Enemy. Enemy? Alienated. 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 Spirit to work it into the children of disobedience. The child of disobedience. Yeah, hey, Dan, that's what we're looking at. Right. He's the, I was talking about he's disobedient. He is disobedient, but we're looking at his particular dynamic. Just fools professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. He is a fool. He's definitely a fool. Yeah. <laughs> We're looking at, see, you're saying all of these things, but what I'm asking you, when you see somebody, okay. what's the first thing you see about it? Y'all got to be real. Y'all got to just straight up talk. He needs to be saved. He needs to, how do you know he needs to be saved? Not, he didn't even talk their, to him. Their speech. Their parents. Speech. Parents. That's their parents. Now, that's where we're going. The parents. Okay. Do you believe the way you receive people is based upon you, how you perceive their uh, their appearance? Does God respect their person? God is not. No. God is not, but are we? But, I mean, not we, but uh, it's mankind. So basically, uh, that's what I'm saying. You're looking at, I'm really trying to get you to really see the dynamics of how we are to make this work. When you talk about being transformed by the renewing of your mind, that means you have to begin to start looking and viewing things differently. True. So now my perception of how I see people has to be different if I'm a member of the body of Christ. If in time past, see, this is what I have to, this is why I have to do this all the time. I have to become transparent in order for you to understand what I'm saying because I ask a question that I should have been knocking out the park and you didn't get it. This is why I say this quite a bit. I was born in December 10, 1964, in Buffalo, New York, Deaconess Hospital. They tore the hospital down. I was sad they tore the hospital down. <laughs> but they tore it down. Either way, I was born within a mile, I mean, within a mile of that hospital I lived in that neighborhood, right off Humboldt Parkway. Some of you are familiar with it, some of you might not be. I was born in the neighborhood. Back in the 60s, I'm a child in the 60s, um, parents, church-going parents, my grandparents raised me, my mother father got divorced when I was real young. Only upbringing I really remember is the upbringing that my grandparents gave me. My grandparents were from the deep south in Georgia. They came up here for better, to try to seek out better life for themselves, to try to escape from some of the um, things that were going on down in the south. And they came up to Buffalo, New York with a certain mindset to try to do better for their children. Um, I wasn't one of their children, but I was the offspring of one of their children. So now I become a part of their environment and a part of what they're developing and the mindset and understanding that they have within the home. However, for some reason, I don't know, but within my house, my grandmother, who was raised in the Deep South, and here we go, she was raised in the Deep South, had nothing but good things to say about 
other races of people, and not majorly Caucasian people. She always said nice, wholesome things about people. She made me believe that if you just dealt with people like they are, you got <laughs> people who were nice, and you had people that weren't so nice in every race. That's the kind of attitude she had. Now, however, that's what she used to say. And she was pretty much the primary person in my, in my mindset and the upbringing. However, I had uncles and aunts that was raised like brothers and sisters that lived in the neighborhood that didn't project that same feeling. And now you know this. There's a point in your life where your parents are more influential on you, but the ones who are even more influential on you are your siblings. You ever realize that? Especially your big sister or your little brother, your big brother, your little brother. So they would be even that much more influential in your life sometimes. So with that being said, we live in a neighborhood in the late 60s, early 70s, that there's so much volatile things going on as it pertains, and it's still going on today, as it was, I believe, a lot more severe back then, as it pertains to race relations and different things and what you see on TV. And, and like, I hope you don't think, like, why did you keep talking about this? I have to talk about it because if I don't talk about it, we'll never understand how we have to transform our mind to be who Christ wants us to be in the, in the midst of it. I'm not, just, I'm not just harping on things like this. I want you to really be prepared to change your mind. Because some of us have not changed our minds. I changed mine. I had to take off what was developed from that neighborhood. That neighborhood projected a hatred towards Caucasian people. And in fact, in the neighborhood, there was a line of division. What street didn't you go past when you was young? Going, going east. Well, you wasn't supposed to go past. Start with a B. Bailey. Broadway. Bailey. Oh, Bailey. <laughs> Bailey. Well, Broadway. <laughs> but we talking Bailey. You know, and, and, and I didn't, I, I, I shouldn't have prompted you. I wanted to see if you, but I wanted to understand, see, this is the reality. I didn't cue him up on that. That this is the mindset that's going on back then. So now when you begin to understand that there are things that are developing in me as a young man as I'm growing, and I'm not much taller than this now, so this won't be much. But as I'm growing, I'm still bringing all of that old stuff along with me. And then I'm bust out to a school that's in deep west side called Lafayette High School. And I don't know what Lafayette y'all know today, but the Lafayette I went to back then was 97% Italian. And I have some real good Italian friends. Yeah. yeah, 97, it's a lot different now. It's, it's a totally different school. I think they're about to close it. So. But either way, what I'm saying, we had to get to the school. That was the issue. What I'm trying to say, pre pre present to you in a short manner, because I know time is wearing out, is that if you understand where you are and you know America, in America, we have this thing that we want to keep sweeping under the carpet that is called racism. Racism is, is responsible for the reason that Sunday is the most segregated day in America. But we got something special here at Grace Family Bible Church. Yeah. And you know what it shows me? It shows me that the doctrine Works. has began to supersede the mindset and the conformity of the old man. That's where it has to be. It shows me that the reason when I began to understand sound doctrine and all those different things that my little friends would tell me about people and contrary or didn't look like me, I began to understand that if we're all one in Christ and there's no male or female, Jew or Gentile, I mean Jew or, uh, Jew or Greek, and I, we're all one in Christ, and now Christ is, is, is God's desire that all men be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth, those divisions that I have made up in my mind based upon this old man has to fade away. That can no longer be a part of who I, how I perceive people. I have to perceive people as all men, and either you're saved or unsaved, either you're a believer or you're not a believer, so what comes out of your mouth, my projecting to you is not going to be based on this. It's going to be based on the fact that I'm an ambassador for Christ and you might need to be saved. And then I have to really shake off any animosity or anger that I have towards you because I have to love you in order to properly administer that grace. Oh, I hope you get this. I have to love you in spite of how your extension to me is. 
And I have to tell you, I've been some places to some grace conferences that I didn't get such a warm greeting and a warm reception. But I had to be tough-skinned enough that I'm doing this for Christ. This ain't about me. Amen. You have to get this. Amen. You have to know that you're not a part of the equation. It's almost like you have a mask on. This is not about little Leroy from, from the east side, Cold Spring. This is about this new transformed individual that's been made new in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away. What? Behold, all, things all things become new. That every part of you has to become new. And what's slowing up your, your process of being made totally new is the fact that you're not allowing your mind to be transformed. God is positionally to say this. That's nothing going to change about that. But from our practice, we have to transform our mind by studying to show ourselves approved unto God as working who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We have to experience the love of God so that my extension to you is the love of God. I have to understand how God received me in spite of myself being contrary to him so that I'll receive you in spite of whatever I thought that I had preconceived notion I had about you. That's my mindset. That's where we need to be. And when we get there, God can utilize us in a way that God can get the glory out of our lives. We'll have a little bit over time, so remember the fact that Christ died for our sins according to Scripture, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day by trusting in that. That's what set this ball rolling. Outside of believing that gospel, none of this makes any sense. So that gospel is first and foremost. Any questions or comments? Go ahead. This is a football player. His name is ben Benjamin Watson. And this is a statement he made. They asked him about Ferguson, and he made this long statement because you know they give the players a, a platform to say something. He says, I'm encouraged because God has provided a solution for sin through his son Jesus with it, a transformed heart and mind one that's capable of looking past the outward and seeing what's truly important. In every human being, the cure for Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, Tamar Rice, Eric Garner tragedies is not education or exposure. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. So finally, I'm encouraged because the gospel gives mankind hope. Wow, what a statement to make on such a national platform when somebody is looking for you to incite a riot or to say something, how many of you heard that? How many heard that? He, that's what I'm saying. How many of you heard that he said? He said this before his football game last month, uh, last week. Uh, he's a New Orleans Saint, and they were playing a big game because whoever wins in and whoever is loses is out. This is what I'm telling you. This is how little pub when you say the right thing you're going to get. Now, when you say something negative, it's going to blast the airwaves. But when you say something that's wholesome and that's going to give somebody some hope, that's when you're going to find yourself looking on the outside in. Now, this is actually a uh, the thing that I projected on my page, my Facebook page last week. Um, actually, I wanted to... This is the first portion of it. I thought I had actually written the whole thing out, but possibly I didn't. Some of you may have seen it on my page. And it really is making a statement because... We have to show what we represent, and we show it by the words, the transformed words that come out of our mouth. And I'm just going to read the first portion of it. It says, I refuse to engage in, entertain, or give audience to any prejudicial, stereotyping, or negative conversation concerning any other racial or ethnic or religious group in an effort to be made all things to all mankind that I might by all means preach Christ unto their salvation. My ambassadorship for Christ is far too precious slash important for me to jeopardize the opportunity, the possibility of being effectual in sharing the gospel with all mankind. Um, I went on to say some more things, but I didn't have them on this page. But the reason I wanted to state that is because you have to make a statement somewhere. You have to let people know that they're, when they expose certain things to you, you are automatically have a response that's going to give God glory and it's not going to reflect on this old man that you are. Because this is who they see you as. 
If they see you as the same one that used to say negative things about other groups and races and different things like that, they feel comfortable saying it around you. And I had to make my, I had to let them know. People, if people still are saying, if they're comfortable to say negative things about other people around me, I haven't done my job. Or I'm not presenting myself in a way that they should know that there's something different about me. I hope you get this. So if you're still in the midst of a lot of those conversations and you're just like giving them that, almost like that nod of approval because you're really not, you know, bold enough to say, come on now, you know, I, I don't feel that way, so I'm uncomfortable about you, you saying that about that person or that those people. Go ahead, brother. John. I just want to share this one verse, which kind of wraps up everything.